It's about time for us to begin this evening. Thank you all for, for coming out. We're glad, we're glad that you are here. Very happy to have uh, Keith and Anna and Titus uh, with us for a couple of days. Uh, no strangers to us. We know them very well, and Keith done an excellent job this morning, and I'm sure there will be more, more of the same this evening. I do want to mention uh, some folks right here at our congregation, and these people are looking at surgeries. Uh, Norman Cookston, that's Tiffany's dad, is having surgery on Wednesday. They're going in to repair some stents that are already there, and so this is a pretty big deal. That'll be over at Erlanger. Also, Roy Pendergrass finds out on Wednesday when he will have that heart surgery. David Lane finds out Wednesday when he will have his back surgery. Uh, Francis personally knows her knee replacement will be August the 2nd. Let's be uh, stacking up the prayers for all of those folks. Scott would like for us to continue to pray for his dad, Doc Long. Doc has not really been doing well for quite some time now. Uh, continued prayers for him. Uh, tonight, Kim is going to be leading our singing. Brian Moody is going to lead us in prayer. I'll be taking care of the Lord's table, and then Sawyer Pendergrass is going to lead the closing prayer.
bow while we pray. <clears throat> Merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to assemble here this evening. We thank you, Holy Father, for the speaker of the hour. We thank you, Father, for the church. We thank you for each and every household that is represented here this evening. Forgive us of our sins, Father, that our prayer and our worship would come up to thee unhindered. Father, we thank you so much for this leadership among this congregation. We thank you so much for the church. We'd ask, Father, that by all means you bring forth more sound leadership throughout the congregations that exist throughout the world, that you would bring forth that sound leadership and that you would strengthen their hands, strengthen their resolve, give them the education and the wisdom that they need in order to govern. We'd ask, Father, that you would bring forth more teachers and more preachers uh, good and faithful, godly preachers, such as the one that we have visiting with us and Brother T.A., we'd ask, Father, that you strengthen their hands, strengthen, strengthen their resolve, and that you would bring forth a multitude of those willing to teach and to preach <clears throat> uh, throughout the world. Here in the United States, we have such a drought of, of needing preachers and who are faithful to spread your word. And we just ask that you would bring forth more faithful, godly preachers and faithful, godly elders that each and every congregation may have the appropriate uh, preaching and representation and leadership that it needs. We're mindful, Father, of those that were mentioned that uh, are going through surgeries. We ask your blessings upon that. Those that are sick, we ask that you care for them. We pray for those that are chronically ill due to age, uh, elder being elderly, and we ask that their pain be minimum and that their uh, spiritual foundation will be strong as they enter the latter parts of their lives. <clears throat> Father, we live in a world of mass communication, and just as Lot's soul was vexed daily as he dwelt among the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, we cannot help but feel the mourning and the loss and the utter shock about the moral decline within our country a nation that no longer protects its children, it protects the innocent, but we, have, we live in a nation where evil is called good and good is called evil. Father, we just desperately ask that you would help our nation to seek a better path, that whatever needs to be done, that uh, you would look down upon us and turn to mercy and change the course of this country, that you would change the course of the minds and hearts of all those uh, in positions of authority, that they would govern in such a way that uh, righteousness and life would be sacred and that uh, the lives of the innocent and the children that exist would be protected within our legal system and that uh, the moral decay and the utter rot that's going on in our country would cease and would change course. Father, we thank you for all the uh, faithful, wonderful people that are here this evening. We know that each and every one all have problems in their lives. We ask that you look down upon them and tend to mercy and care for us each and every day and each and every step that we take. Help us to uh, find faith, strong faith in you each and every day. Help us, Father, to increase our faith uh, and help us to love and strengthen one another. And we uh, ask that you be with us as we go through this service. In Christ's name, amen.
Good evening. It's good to see you here again on another another time that we have to study God's Word together. Um, this morning, I began a series uh, called My Christian Walk. Uh, we talked about my walk with Jesus. Um, tonight, we're going to, our, our topic for this evening is my walk in holiness. My walk in holiness. Uh, at the end of the book of Exodus, after, you know, in your Bible reading, you read through Genesis, and then you get to Exodus, there's 40 chapters there. If you, when you get to the end of the book um, in, uh, in Exodus, after they erect the tabernacle, uh, there's much excitement in the air that uh, the people, Moses, is about to enter the presence of, of God, uh, and uh, much excitement um, that, that's going on. Uh, but then they hit a roadblock in uh, the latter part of the very last chapter in the book of Exodus. They hit a roadblock in that they are not, Moses specifically, he is not able to even enter the presence of God. Like he was before, like he was prior, now all of a sudden he's not able to. He's not able to go in and commune with God. Notice with me in Exodus chapter 40, verse 34 through 35, it says this, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses, it says in verse 35, was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. They cannot go into the tabernacle because... Their sin has damaged their relationship with God in more ways than they can fathom, in more ways than they realize in the moment. The Bible teaches that God, our God, the God that we worship and serve, is a holy God. The prophet Isaiah says in chapter 57, verse 15, he says in verse 15 of 57, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Now to say that God is holy is to say that he is unique above all else. His glory extends above the heavens. There is no being in heaven, on earth, or under the earth that is as unique as the God that we worship and serve. He is holy. There's nothing and no one like Him. He is pure. He is the essence of perfection. He's the standard of all that's right, all that's good, all that's wholesome, and all that is true within the world. Our God is holy. Now the Bible also teaches that sin presents a major problem in relation to God's holiness. God desires to dwell with human beings. We see that in the very first uh, pages of the, 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 the Bible. God wanting to dwell with uh, the human creatures that, that He created in the, in, in the Garden of Eden. But at the same time, His holy nature abhors their sinful condition and their rebellion that they have chosen. Notice with me what the pro prophet Habakkuk says in chapter 1, verse 13 of his book. Habakkuk says, You, God, Yahweh, our God, who are of purer eyes than to see evil, cannot look at wrong. Now, the biblical doctrine of sin teaches that sin is more devastating than we possibly have the ability to even fathom. And not only does sin create a rift in our relationship with God, and, and, and it does, but sin also acts like an infectious disease. It's like a silent, undetectable cancer that, that continuously invades the human mind, the emotions, and the will, and inevitably results in death, both physical and spiritual. 
Psalm 11 verse 5 says, the psalmist says in verse 5, The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked. Not just a certain group of people or a certain kind of people or a certain class of people does this describe, but the Bible teaches that all people have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. People have committed personal sin. The Bible teaches that there is none righteous, no, not one. All of our good works, all of our good deeds in in an attempt to, to earn God's favor are like Filthy rags, the prophet Isaiah says, in the eyes of God, because sin has so corrupted humanity that there is nothing we could possibly do by our own power or our own strength to repair the damage that it has caused within us and within the cosmos. We are dead, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, in our sins and in our trespasses. Now, this biblical doctrine of sin, it presents a major problem because God's holiness is like the sun. It's good. It's pure. It's, the sun is something good. The sun is, is, uh, is, is, is something that, that brings warmth, that brings light to us. It, it's good and pure. But at the same time, like the holiness of God, it's dangerous. And it will kill you if you approach it, approach it without the proper protection, without taking the necessary measure. And, and God's the same way. It's not because God is hateful. It's not because God is unloving. It's not because God is unkind. Our God is a God of compassion. Our God is a God of grace and mercy that desires the, repentant, the repentance of, of lost sinner. But, 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 uh, but, but this is so because... Um, uh, his, his reaction against sin um, is so um, intense because he is so good, because he is holy. A good, holy God, by definition, must punish evil, must punish sin. So we get back to the book of Exodus, like I mentioned a moment ago. This presents a major problem to the Israelites. They want to enter the presence of God. They want to commune with God. They want to enter the tabernacle and the dwelling place um, of God, but they can't. And then the next book, the book that we often skip over in our daily Bible reading and just go to 1 John or something like that, the book of Leviticus is the answer to the problem that is presented in Exodus chapter 40, the problem of uh, their inability to enter into the presence of God. A sacrifice has to be made for the people to enter God's presence. And not just a sacrifice, not just a mere sacrifice, but a blameless representative must offer their own life, making atonement for the people's sin so that they can enter God's presence. That word atonement is best understood if we break it up into three parts. At one meant. At one meant. It's the repairing of a broken relationship due to sin. And of course, we as Bible students know that this is all pointing, everything within the book of Leviticus is pointing to the ultimate sacrifice, uh, to the one who has the power to make ultimate atonement for the sin of man. And that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who allows us to enter into God's presence, to commune with Him, to have a relationship with Him, to grow and to thrive in Him, all because of what He has done for us in His death and His burial and His resurrection. Paul says this in Titus chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, in reference to that. Titus chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. It says, Paul says here in verse 5, He, God, saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The Bible teaches that when one is baptized into Jesus Christ, they contact 
the blood of Jesus. That's the moment in time in which they contact Jesus' blood, which has the power to make them holy and, and, and allows us to intimately commune with God as He's desired from the very beginning of time, as we see within the Garden of Eden. But this atoning power, this resurrection power of God that He has displayed uh, for us, it doesn't stop, it doesn't cease at baptism. It continues, it's a continuous work of the Spirit on the heart of the Christian all throughout their journey, all throughout their walk. Paul says many times that a Christian is one who is being renewed. A Christian is one who is being saved. And that describes you and I. If we are in Jesus Christ, we are being renewed. We are being saved. We are being sanctified. The Christian journey, it's a process. It's a process of continuous renewal that will not be complete until Jesus Christ returns to this earth, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Now, in saying all of that, that's all a backdrop to what I want, really want to talk about tonight. My Christian walk is a walk, is a journey in holiness. It's a continuous process of me being made into the image of Jesus Christ, my will being conformed to His. It's a continuous walk in holiness. Holiness. It's, it's a surrender to the direction and guidance of the Holy Spirit, allowing Him, keeping in step with Him, allowing Him to renew my heart and conform my will to the will of God. The Christian walk is a walk in holiness. And we need to remember that as we uh, endeavor and embark on this Christian journey. So for the remainder of our time, what I want to do is I want to talk about what it means to walk in holiness and just to give you a few points of how we um, as uh, God's people can do so more effectively within our Christian experience. How we can walk in holiness. Number one, walking in holiness means to see sin for what it really is, ugly beyond measure. If you've ever seen the movie uh, The Matrix, um, you, you know that, uh, that it, it portrays this fantasy world. Um, everybody thinks that uh, the world that they're living in is, the, is, is, is reality, but, but, but in reality it's not. There's a very different uh, kind of existence. Um, mo that, that describes, in, in, uh, in all honesty, most people today. Most people today live in this fantasy world and, and, and possess a completely inaccurate view of the reality of sin and its devastating effects. One text that I like to go to that, uh, that helps us to see uh, the, uh, the, the vividness of, 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 of sin and what it does to the human heart is Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. It says, When he, a leper, came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper, excuse me, to Jesus, and then a leper came to him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Now, leprosy within this uh, context here. Leprosy is intended by the biblical authors to be a vivid illustration of the effects of sin. Um, as you have studied probably in prior in your, in your Bible classes what, uh, what leprosy would do to a person, you would pretty much be a walking, um, a walking dead person. Um, if you had uh, leprosy, your skin uh, would uh, begin to deteriorate and rot um, off of your bones. Um, it would be incredibly painful, um, a horrible way um, to, uh, to, to, to die, which would be uh, your inevitable fate. And what the Bible is intending to teach through us by the way of an illustration, by the way of the, uh, the leprosy illustration, is that just as leprosy converts a living person into a walking dead man who is doomed to, to, his, to his inevitable fate, to his inevitable demise, so sin infects a soul leading to death. 
Sin uh, has more devastating effects that we can even realize in the moment. And walking in holiness, walking with Jesus Christ in holiness is a recognition of sin and what it does to the human heart. Now, another uh, principle that teaches us uh, the reality of sin and opens our minds to what it really is is in Matthew chapter 13, I believe, in verse 41. Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. I'm going to read verse 41 and 42. It says here, The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will gather out His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, in saying this, I'm not just trying to uh, invoke fear within you. I'm not just trying to um, scare you to death by teaching the biblical doctrine of of hell. Uh, But as we think about hell rationally, it can help us to better understand what sin is as we think about it logically. Uh, the, 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 the theology of hell, it actually helps us to see sin in its true light, what it really is, how horrible and corrupt it really is. We all know that God, our God, He's a just God. He, he's a good God. God. He doesn't give anybody anything that they don't deserve. If God gives you, a, if God punishes you, punishes you in some way, uh, then you deserve that. Whatever you've done has merited that punishment. God is a good God. God is a just God. Now, if all people deserve, and this is what the Bible teaches, and remember, this is for our blessing, so that we may walk in holiness. If all people deserve eternal separation in a place as horrific as the Bible describes, a lake of fire, a place of gloomy darkness, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, then that must mean that our sin that has entered the world by our own decision, by our choice, that it must mean that our sin must be as equally as horrific. As we behold the doctrine of hell, it helps us to see what sin really is, how horrible um, it is, and the devastating effects of it. And we know that to walk in holiness is to never forget what sin is and, and the ugly effects that it renders within the human heart. We know that Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We know, we know that our hearts, the human heart, it's prone to wonder. I remember the song, uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Remember one of the verses at the very end, prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. If you want to be a person that walks in holiness, walks in the path of Jesus Christ, make it your prayer, not just every so often, but every single day, Lord, help me to see sin for what it really is. Help me to see the ugliness of sin, and help me to see the beauty of who you are and the beauty of your grace. And that will help you tremendously to walk in holiness closer to the arms of Jesus. Now, a second thing uh, that I would like to talk about in reference to walking in holiness, walking in holiness means to keep in step with the Spirit of God and allow Him to conform my heart and my will to the heart and the will of God. We know that Satan attacks us in so many different ways. Uh, but, but one of the primary blessings of, of being a Christian is, is that we not only have the power within us to defend against 
His schemes, but we have the Spirit of God who actually, we're going to look at a text here in a moment, the Spirit of God actually goes on the offensive against our adversary, against Satan. Look with me in Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. And notice with me what the Apostle Paul says. Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. Paul says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, the verb in Greek here rendered keep in step here also means to walk in line behind a leader. It means to follow after one that's more powerful uh, than you. Uh, and it almost carries the idea of, 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 of a military leader that, that leads his troops into battle against a foe, against an adversary, against uh, an, an enemy. And the implication here, what Paul is trying to teach us, is that, uh, is that the Spirit of God is not just some passive force that solely shields people, uh, God's people, from the enemy's attacks. Rather, the Spirit of God goes on the offensive and leads His people into battle against the works of the flesh, as we see within the prior verses there. Uh, and, and if you look at a few verses earlier, as we're about to do, uh, you can see uh, the weapons that our general, in essence, the Spirit, produces within us and gives us to fight our adversary, the devil. Look with me just a few verses earlier in Galatians chapter 5. Verses 22 through 23. Verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The Spirit of God fights against sin, not, not only in the defensive sense, but in attack by producing in Christians the positive attributes of Jesus like character, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are my weapons in spiritual warfare that the Spirit produces within me as I keep in step with Him. The Spirit makes me holy, the Bible teaches. The Spirit untangles the web of my sinful nature. The Spirit continuously performs a work of sanctification within my heart. However, I must allow Him to do so. Notice with me what Paul says elsewhere in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. Paul says there in verse 19, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. When we think about the verb to quench, to quench is what you do when you extinguish a fire, is it not? When a fire is roaring and, 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 it's, and, it's, ra and it's raging uh, and you pour water on it, you quench it, you extinguish it, you put it out. You make its incredible power come to a screeching halt. And you do the same thing. When you quench the Spirit of God in your life, when you choose to define good and evil, right and wrong, how you see fit. When you choose to love sin more than you choose to love the will of God, you quench the Spirit's sanctifying, making you holy work within your life. Also notice with me what Paul says again in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. He says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Bible also says here that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. We grieve the Spirit when we participate in the works of the flesh that Paul describes in Galatians, the fifth chapter, and when we fail to surrender to His leading, to His guidance. So we can possibly quench the work of the Spirit who makes us holy, who sanctifies us. And we grieve the Spirit when we fail to follow His leadership, when we, um, when we don't keep in step with Him. 
This is what it means to walk in holiness. To walk in holiness means to keep in step with our general, with our leader, God Himself. To follow His leading, to follow His guidance and allow Him to make me new, to transform me into something magnificent, into something beautiful that is going to be completed when Jesus Christ returns, as Paul says in the book of Philippians. So the last thing that I would like to talk about, the last aspect of walking in holiness is the fact that walking in holiness is a walk that leads to true happiness Satisfaction and contentment, contrary to what many people in the world today think and believe. We know that the human heart, as we can see by experience, is a desire factory. And people pursue happiness, people pursue pleasure, people pursue satisfaction in a plethora of ways. In all kinds of uh, pursuits and endeavors to people uh, chase after happiness and contentment and pleasure. And it's interesting that in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13 that we're going to read here in a moment, the Apostle Paul, he claims that he has found the secret to contentment. He claims that he has found the secret to true and lasting satisfaction. Notice with me what he says in verse 11 of Philippians chapter 4. Paul says here, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The secret, the secret to true contentment, to true satisfaction and and embarking down the path that leads to true happiness and fulfillment and contentment can only be experienced By walking in holiness with Jesus, as Paul displays within his own life. Notice with me what the psalmist says in Psalm 16, verse 11. He says, you make known to me the path. Remember, a path is is the way in which one walks. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Not just some kind of of, of superficial happiness and contentment which, which only lasts temporarily and then vanishes away, but this text says that fullness, fullness of joy exists in holy fellowship with God Almighty. Notice the illustration here. You can't get fuller than full. You can't get fuller than full. If I had a glass of water up here tonight that was full to the brim, I couldn't fill it up anymore. That is as as full as you could possibly get it. God's commands, His precepts, what He has directed you to do within the Christian journey, within the Christian experience, um, it, it experience is not intended, it's not intended to put a heavy yoke around your neck, t- turning you into, into some kind of unfulfilled, unsatisfied slave. God's commands, His precepts, His law, His directives, everything that He has told you to do while living within the Christian journey and the Christian experience are for your blessing. They're for your joy. God isn't a a fun killer, contrary to what many people believe. God, our God, is a joy enhancer. And walking in holiness is a walk that leads to true satisfaction. And that satisfaction, the Bible teaches, isn't only a, a satisfaction that's experienced in the future. It's only a, it's on, it, it isn't only a satisfaction that's experienced within eternity when we enter the arms of the Savior in heaven, but it's a satisfaction 
in the here and now. A holy life is a truly fulfilled life. A holy life is a peace-filled life. A holy life is a life that sings with confidence that God dwells and works within me. That's what holiness leads to. True satisfaction. True contentment. And if you want to know the secret of what it means to be really fulfilled, walk in holiness with Jesus and keep in step with the Spirit. If you're a Christian tonight, you're like a caterpillar inside of a cocoon. There's a work that's being performed upon your heart. You are being transformed into something magnificent, into something beautiful. Um, and, and, and the Bible calls this process the process of sanctification. The Bible tells us to keep in step with the Spirit of God. Allow Him to transform you from the inside out and you will be able to taste the sweetness of walking in holiness with Jesus Christ. If you have any need tonight, if there's any prayers uh, that uh, anybody would, would like to have asked on, on their behalf, um, or if you're not a Christian and, and uh, you've heard the gospel message, um, you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, do a 180 in your, in your life, live a life of continual repentance, and you can come forward tonight and confess your faith in Jesus, and you can be immersed in water tonight and, and uh, for the forgiveness of, of your sins, contacting the very blood of Jesus Christ. You can do that tonight if you have need as we stand and as we sing. If you have not had an opportunity to take the Lord's Supper today, then we would like to give you that, uh, that opportunity uh, right now. Is there anyone in the audience who needs one of the prepackaged communion cups? 
All right, then, if you are in need of taking the Lord's Supper, if you will remove the, the cellophane cover, it will give you uh, access uh, to the unleavened bread. Now, would you bow with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for this, this bread, which represents the blood of Jesus that was nailed to the cross so that we might have the chance and the opportunity to, to spend eternity in heaven. Please help those who partake of this emblem to do so in a way that is, that is right in your sight. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, if you will remove the, the second cover that will give you access to the fruit of the vine. Please pray with me. Our Father, we continue our prayer this evening by giving you thanks for the fruit of the vine, which to those of us who are believers in, in your Son, Jesus Christ, it represents the blood that he shed on the cross so that our sins could be could be washed away. Again, we pray that each and every time that, that we partake of this emblem, we will do so in a way that is right in your sight. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you have not had an opportunity to, to make your first day of the week contribution and you would like to do so, then there are collection trays uh, in the foyer as you go out. And also, if you go out this door, uh, you can also make your contribution uh, as you go that way. Would you bow with me as we offer thanks for our blessings? Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for all the many things that you have given us and we know that they all come down from above and we give you the glory and the praise for them all. We pray, our Father, that as we return a portion of that to you, that we will do so in a way that is right in your sight, realizing and understanding that God loves a cheerful giver. And we pray that what we give this evening will be used and applied in, in such a way that would be right in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you all again for coming out and being with us uh, this evening. We appreciate Keith and the good job that he's doing for us. He will be with us again tomorrow night at 7 p.m., and we would love to see you at that service. Uh, Kim is going to lead us in a closing song, and then we will be dismissed. Would you please stand for the closing song?
Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for another time that you've allowed us to come together and to hear a portion of your word, Lord, and to worship you. Lord, help us to receive what we've heard tonight and help us to apply it to our lives so that we can walk in holiness and not just walk in holiness, but let that holiness be a light for you, be an example for you, and let others see your works and what you do and turn to you, Lord, because they see how we live for you. Lord, thank you for the message tonight, and please be with the rest of the lessons that we hear in this series. Help them to all be as good and as meaningful and as truthful and encouraging as what we've already heard, Lord. Please be with us as we depart, and please help us to all come back again so that we can hear the message tomorrow night, Lord. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.